Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How is everybody doing? Did you have a great long weekend? That's good to know. I also had a wonderful weekend. And I had a feeling not long enough. I'm a bit out of touch with the dates. Uh, you guys have recess coming up soon as well. If I'm not mistaken, I guess still May. Okay. Then we are almost halfway through this semester. So I'm just looking here at a few of the comments. So good evening. I was wondering how these distances that he moves are actually measured relative to the point or object you pick. Okay, so part of that we're going to discuss this evening. We're going to do a little bit of that math. So class quotation is a little bit better compared to last week, but still we still don't have as much as the first two weeks of class. Is anything else happening this week? That explains a few things. When is your semester, how late is your semester test tonight? Mr. Ross? Ah, okay. Okay, so that explain a few things. Um, have you guys started with your moon assignment? And what, and have you noticed something interesting about the moon so far? Yes. So that's why I chose the moon That's exactly why I chose the moon to observe was due to that movement. Uh, so the location I picked caused the moon goes. No, it's not late to start over. So remember, yeah, I think I, I can't remember the submission date. I think it's run about the 10th of June, run about there. So you still have a lot of time to do it. Just make sure you pick the time correctly, so when you do your observations, that a moon is high enough, and in the 10 days, that a moon doesn't disappear behind the horizon or an obstacle. So yes, unexpected appearance of clouds, unfortunately that happens with astronomy. I have that problem as well. Um, just a heads up, uh, but you can get away with it if you know, if you can see opening through the clouds, then you can still continue on with your observation. But this weekend, it's going to be rainy and cold. Okay, so I'm going to paste, uh, there's a few apps you guys can use to help you with this. One of them is Stellarium, Star Sky View. And um, let me paste this link. So in this link, when I paste, you're gonna, you'll be able to set your location. 
and then there's a nice interactive graph on each date that you can use to see at what time will the moon be there. So you can't see the moon line of time today, then you can use an app such as Stellarium, Google Sky View, or anything just to assist you. I'm actually not sure. It should Stellarium should be on an app store, but I know it's open source for your computers as well. So with regards to your measurements, must we measure from our reference point? Yes, you measure everything from your reference point. So that's why it's important you do the measurements from the exact same location and time every day. So how do we do our measurements? So you will, for example, on a piece of paper, draw what you can see around you for a tree in a distance, building in a distance. And then you will draw where the moon is every time you observe it on that drawing. And then you'll have the scale. So your moon scale and your surrounding scale are two different scales. So then from there on, you will be able to calculate everything. Yes, you guys are more than welcome to use Stellarium. Uh, does page count include references? No, page count doesn't include references. So what do you mean the moon scale is different? You need a scale for the size of the moon. So a good idea is, for example, to use a coin to draw the moon. But the scale around you for your... So you can't relate the size of the moon to the objects around you. So you need two different scales. So I say that in the guide as well. So Stellarium, there is a free version for it as well. Well, the computer version is free. On iOS, you can use Google's uh, Skyview. So coming to tonight's lecture, you all still following what we discussed in the previous lectures, understand all the topics we have covered so far. Yes, Mr. Libuyo. Good evening, sir. How are you? Uh, fine, thanks in yourself, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I have um, a question about um, uh, light, sir. Yes. So, sir, um, you say, sir, when light travels in space, it, it, it loses energy from distant places, right? Uh, light doesn't really lose energy uh, because it's going through a vacuum. So light, you think about it as an electro, part of the electromagnetic wave spectrum. So as you're traveling through space, the, your electric field, magnetic field will remain the same. Yes, sir. But then, sir, when you say, so like, sir, when we were speaking about uh, radio astronomy, sir, you said that uh, radio waves from um, distant, uh, distant objects, they have weak, like, like they come with weak signals, right? Yes. So oh. what I mean, what I mean with weak signals is, if we look at a, let's say, a source of electromagnetic radiation that is a couple of light years away. Um, okay, let me do, let me do this with a sketch. That will, this will be easier to explain it with a sketch. So when we speak about electromagnetic radiation and the intensity we receive from the... Yes, Ms. Austin. Oh. 
you are more than welcome to go ahead. Okay, while I'm waiting for Ms. Let me show you, we're going to talk about this evening flux and flux density. We're going to discuss it in depthly. But if we look at the incoming electromagnetic radiation from an object, we figure out of high intensity, low intensity. But intensity is basically short for flux intensity. So we look at the total flux of an object. So flux is the definition of the easiest way to do this will be with a sketch. So if this is our object, and these are our electromagnetic field lines going through. The more of these field lines passes through an object, the higher its flux density will be. So if we have, a, so that's why the field lines and the object has to be 90 degrees from each other to get the maximum maximum intensity but if we have the same object again like this and our incoming electromagnetic waves is parallel to the object this means that our angle now if there's no angle so this is now zero degrees so that means we will have no flux density. And now, usually these objects we are looking for, take a star, for example, is round. So now, if we have our round object, so let's say, for example, our own sun. This is our sun, and we have our electromagnetic waves popping out everywhere. If we are closer to the sun, let's say for example we are right next to the sun and here is our surface area we are working with, we can see there's a lot of field lines crossing it the closer we are to the object. But now we are further away from the object, so that means the further away from the object and as means these scatter out and I miss some part of the area meaning our total collecting area becomes smaller so the total flux density we see from the object is a lot less. So if we have our radio telescope and we point it towards an object we want to observe these electromagnetic field lines we will receive fewer of them. Take for example, we have the same telescope and we put now a cell phone next to the telescope, meaning more of the field lines of the telescope will, field lines from the cell phone will interact with the telescope and that means the flux density of the cell phone will be larger than we see if the object in space. So that's why it's important to be in a radio quiet zone so unfortunately that's why these of the signals and information we pick up from space is very weak signals and uh, mr Lebrillo, does that answer your question uh yes sir so and i'm assuming that the arrows are just like for illustrative purposes not just yeah, like no this is just illustrative purposes okay 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 so, 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 another interesting point, so that that, that you made, sir, about uh, 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 how astronauts to, uh, communicate with one another in space. You said uh, they communicate with radio waves, right? So that means that basically the communication they're using is like when they speak, their voices are turned into light. You can almost think about it that way. So, light forms part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, 
radio waves on part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when astronauts are in the same space vehicle, spaceship, rockets, let's say, for example, the International Space Station. In the International Space Station, it's a pressurized vehicle, so there is an atmosphere inside, and sound waves need a medium to propagate through. So while the astronauts are in the spaceship, space station or rocket, they can speak normally to one another. But if you're outside of your space vehicle, then there's no medium for sound waves to propagate through, but there's also no atmosphere, so you can't breathe in any ways. So what's happening is you will have like a two-way radio system where you have a pressurized system. Oh, your, your space suit is pressurized. You'll have a mic. You'll speak into the mic. That is transmitted, and the other astronaut will pick it up on its receiver, and the sound will be played through speakers. Does that answer your question, Mr. Lewio? Uh Yes, sir. Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, Miss Austin, I see your hand is raised. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry to have to take us back a little bit, um, but I have a question about the assignment. Um, I'm not so sure about how to actually measure the distances relative to the point. I look kind of weird just holding my rule up in the sky, and I, I don't actually know like what exactly it is um, we're supposed to do after drawing the diagram of like everything that you can see. Um, what's the next step after that? Okay, that's a very good question. So tonight's lecture will form part of that. And a part of the measuring techniques you're going to use for the assignment, we're going to cover in tonight's lecture. So after the lecture, if you're still wondering about how to do the calculations and measurements, then I will explain it better. Does that answer your question or helps a bit? Yeah, it does. Um, so I'll just continue watching the lecture. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. Awesome. And a few comments uh, that you hear about Cassiopeia. A, no. Mr. Van Abach, perhaps you can inform us of what happened with Cassiopeia. A. In Mr. Grunewald, sir, that's maybe off topic, and I'm not sure how good of a question it is, but I have been watching how 26 meter telescope adapter moves, but I was wondering how did you choose what point in the sky to observe and track, or is it any arbitrary point? No. So, how it works is, and any observatory around the world happen, uh, same process happens. So currently in our trial, our, we have three telescopes, the um, 26 meter, the 15 meter, and then Vigos that we still busy commissioning. The commissioning process was set back, set back a little bit by COVID, but Take, for example, our 26 meter telescopes. Currently, it's booked 80, 18 months in advance. So, if you want to use a 26 meter telescope to observe something, you, the process is each year we have a certain time period that opens where you are able to submit proposals of what you want to observe, why you want to observe it, what relevant data you will see from it. And that is submitted to the NRF, our controlling body, the National Research Foundation. Then there is a panel at the NRF that goes through these proposals. All are, everyone in this panel are as astronomers, physicists, engineers. And then if they decide, well, your proposal is good and it's worthwhile doing that research or observation, then you are allocated a certain time slot on the telescope. And that is put into the scheduling system. And then we provide you with two options. Either we do the observation for you and we just send you the data. We have operational astronomers and that forms part of their job description. Or you can come to our trial, the site itself, and then you can be present while the observation is happening. If you go to other observatories, such as the Green Bank Observatory, uh, 
the schedule is currently booked now 36 months in advanced. Uh, Chandra Space Telescope is now booked 24 months in advance. So everything goes through a proposal. Unless there's something happening that's once off. So for example, um, something strange just entered the solar system and we calculated that it will only it will move through the solar system and disappear in a few days or something flared up and is now dying down, then we can do an emergency observation and point our telescopes to that object and then continue on with the schedule. So Mr. Grunewald, I hope that answers your question. Oh wow, that's really interesting. They found a titanium supernova and NASA says it supports a neutrino-driven explosion. That's very cool. I will read up about that. So let's go to tonight's lecture slides. So from tonight, we are going to see some seriously cool physics. So in last week's lecture, we discussed our sun and how our sun is classified. But every other star in the known universe is basically also a sun. So in this image, all of these are stars and stars are basically suns. But as you can see in this image, they are different sizes, different colors. So in tonight's lecture, we're going to look at the family of stars, how are stars classified, the distances of stars, apparent brightness, intrinsic brightness and luminosity, stellar spectra, star sizes, star masses, binary stars, and a census of stars, including everything that we learned together. So this image, uh, is this image a bit blurred on your side or not? I see, looks like when I uploaded this PDF to Blackboard, it blurred it on my side a little bit. But this image, where our sun is over here, the size in this image is one pixel. So here we can see our sun is one of the biggest stars. We have much bigger stars going around. And that is actually quite amazing. If you guys thought about it, how small we actually are in the universe and how lucky we are that we are in just the right circumstances that we are here today. So when I actually had a few video, I went through my preparation for tonight's class and I actually had a few videos I would have liked to show you guys. But I will immediately after the class uh, post on all our platforms the links to these videos and you will actually be amazed. Yes, there are very excellent videos showing the magnitude of our sun versus other stars. To discover the properties of stars, astronomers use telescopes and instruments such as photometers, cameras, and spectrographs in clever ways to learn the secrets hidden in starlight. The result is a family portrait of the stars. Knowing the distances to stars is the key to knowing most of their other properties, but measuring those distances is very difficult, and these measurements of distances you can apply on your moon assignment as well. So in this lecture, there are a few key points we are going to discuss. Firstly, how far away are the stars? How much energy do stars make? How do spectra of stars allow you to determine their temperatures? How big are stars? And lastly, how much mass do stars contain?
that afforded quite entertaining to open tonight's lecture with this quote. To boldly go where no man has gone before, and where does this come from? Where sci-fi fans? Any suggestions who said this quote or where it appeared first in which franchise it belongs to? Yes, Star Trek. Bingo. Shakespeare compared love to a star that can be seen easily and even used for guidance, but whose real nature is utterly unknown. He lived at about the same time as Galileo and had no idea what stars actually are. To understand the history of the universe, the origin of Earth, and your place in the cosmos, you need to discover what people in Shakespeare's time did not know, the real nature of the stars. Unfortunately, it is quite difficult to find out what a star is like. When you look at a star even through a large telescope, you see only a point of light. Real understanding of stars require careful analysis of starlight. To find out almost anything about a star, you must know how far away it is. Although knowing distances is crucial, it is also the most difficult measurement in astronomy. Astronomers have found a number of ways to estimate the distance to stars, but each of those ways ultimately depends on a direct geometrical method that is much like the method surveys use to measure the distances across a river they cannot cross. So why do you guys think it is important for distances to know the distance to a star? What can we learn? if you know the distance to a star. Yes, to have a more accurate scale. Yes, if you know the distance, we can calculate its mass. Yes, if you know the distance, we can calculate its age. What else can we learn? Yes, how it moves, how long it takes flights to reach us, you can measure the slice, all those are important things, and that only comes from how far a star is away. But why is it the most difficult observation to make in astronomy? Yes, you have to, that's, that's one of the reasons. You have to measure the distance relative to something else. That's spot on, but what else? Why is it so difficult to measure? Like, for example, when you walk outside after this lecture and you look up to the night sky and you pick a star, how the hell do you measure the distance to that star? Yes, the star's always moving. That's one other point as well, and that's a good point. But have you guys thought about it? How do you figure out how far stars away? Yes, Mr. Krugel, parallax angles that are very hard to measure. Yes, exactly. So, do you guys have any suggestions of how do we calculate the distance to stars? So using the speed of light relative to its position, yes, that's a way we can calculate it. But then how do we determine its position?
does our atmosphere have an impact on how the distance is calculated? Yes, it does. Do these calculations and observations, a rule of thumb generally is we need our atmosphere as stable as possible. So that's why our telescopes are built in areas where we have less atmospheric disturbances. So do you guys have any suggestions of how we would go about measuring the distances? Yes, housing the, using the sun and earth distance, that comes down to parallax. So, the easiest way to explain geometric parallax method, yes. So this is how surveyors and civil engineers will calculate a distance to something. So I'm going to read a caption and explain it. So you can find a distance D across a river by measuring the length of the baseline and the angles A and B, and then construct the scale drawing of a triangle or use trigonometry to calculate it. So if we have this baseline, we know what this angle is in this basic trigonometry to find the distance. Correct? So, but how would you know how long the light from a star has traveled by just looking at the spectrum? That's a very good question. So, how did we get the baseline? That's a different, that's also a very good question. So, guys are answering very good questions. So, how does long, take, long does the light take to us? That comes from our observations. So it makes sense, the height of a triangle and half base, right? Yes, that's exactly it. So, using so, bit of topic, if you ever went past a construction site and you will see some civil engineer looking through something that looks like a big camera and you have another guy standing far away with a meter stick, they are actually measuring the angles and the baseline to determine the distance to something. So knowing this method, how do you guys think we can transfer this principle to, to the giant scale of measuring distances in space? Reference to the stars is important, but how do we get the big stars? Bingo, if measure every six months. Bingo, parallax. So, transferring this to stars, let's go back one slide. We see here we have angle A, angle B. Going here, we have the distance from the, from the Earth around the Sun. We know this is 1 AU. So we take this measurement here, there's angle A, and over here there's angle B, and D, there's distance we want to the star. And the angle right here, P, is called the parallax angle. That's no problem. If you, have, if you want me to explain something, then just interrupt me at any time. So what we do is, this is how the night sky will look like here, and six months later we will do another observation and take it and look at the same observation. But how do we how do we take this further? Because we now know what the baseline is. How do we get our parallax angle? No, the angles is not necessarily going to be the same. It depends on where this object is. 
So knowing that we have our baseline, this is one AU, one AU, so we have two AUs we can work with. How do we actually find the parallax angle? How do we measure the parallax angle P? Yes, we can use a trig function. With D and 1 AU, so yes, we can do it, but we don't have D yet, so D is what we want. But do you guys see a problem coming up? What would happen if we take this star and we move it further away? That means eventually the parallax angle will become too small to use, right? Yes, so these are problems we're dealing with. So, because the stars are so distant, their parallaxes are very small angles, usually expressed in arc seconds. Astronomers Conventionally called stellar parallax in the shift of the star observed across one AU, so not two U baseline, so we do it in a one AU baseline. Astronomers measure the parallax and surveyors measure the angle at the ends of the baseline, but both measurements reveal the same thing. The shape and size of the triangle and this the distance to the object in question. The distance to stars are so large that astronomers have defined a special unit of distance, the parsec, for use in distance calculations. So before we get to the parsec, are you guys all happy with the parallax? So this parallax method, so the astronomer's triangular method, is one method you can use to calculate the calculations in your moon assignment. Okay, so you see here, uh, Mr. Kisaki, Mr. Tony, you said, no, where have I lost you guys? So now putting this together, the numbers in astronomy, so a stellar parallax, I'm not fully following. Okay, so let me repeat it before continuing. So Mr. Fisaghi, you are you're comfortable with the surveyor's triangular method of how to find the distance of an object? So what we are doing is we are exactly transferring this method to space. So what we, have, what we do is we use one AU as our baseline. So we use this triangle over here, or we use this triangle over here. So we know what our baseline is. We know this is a 90 degree angle. So what we do is we measure this angle right here, or we measure this angle right here, and then we can use basic trigonometry to calculate the distance D. And the angle over here, these angles, are this is referred to as the parallax angle. So that is how we will calculate distances in space. But the problem is, the further an object becomes, the smaller the parallax angle is, and the smaller the angle is, how the hell do we measure it? So we can do this with stars that's relatively close, but stars that's extremely far away, we need a new method of calculating its distance. 
as that help a bit, Mr. Pesach? Mr. Tony, are you still okay? Okay, cool. So I know in our opening lecture, I've talked about parsecs. So in astronomy, when we, sometimes in the AU becomes too small, and the light here also becomes too small. So then we start using a unit of measurement called the parallax, uh, not parallax, the parsec. So the parsec is just basic math. So what we do is, if the angle subtended by one AU is one arc second, the distance is divided as one parsec. So astronomers can measure angles very accurately. So full circle is 360 degrees divided into 60 parts gives arc minutes. Divides into 60 parts gives arc seconds. So we and one parsec equals 3.26 light years. So, how we define it is we can be in a spaceship away from Earth. And if we can see Earth around Sun, so this distance is 1U, and our angle is 1 arc second, then we are 1 parsec away. Yes, so exactly the same as a unit circle, exactly the same. So, 1 parsec is defined as 3.26 light years. So this again is ex just basic math, a unit circle. Are you guys happy with this explanation? So with this formula, if we use, if we are one, if we are one parsec away, we can use this formula distance equals one over the parallax angle. You guys happy? Uh, Mr. Pisaghi, I'm just quickly looking for the formal definition of a unit circle. So a unit circle, circle of unit radius of one. So basically, yes. So if we would draw a circle at this length, the radius will be one parsec. Yes, you are correct. One AU will always give one arc second, no matter what distance. So yes, if we look at this distance here, that's why the AU is so important, because that's our definition in the for the parsec. So before I go on, you guys are comfortable with this.
awesome. I must say, you guys snap things quite easier than the group I had last year. So the course the stars are so distant, the parallaxes are very small angles, usually expressed in arc seconds. Astronomers conventionally call, call stellar parallax the shift of the star observed across one AU and not a two AU baseline. Astronomers measure parallax and surveyors measure the angles at the ends of the baseline, but both measures measurements reveal the same thing, the shape and size of the triangle and thus the distance to the object in question. Distances to stars are so large that astronomers have to find a special unit measure, the parsec, for the use in distance calculations. So the visible star nearest to the Sun, Alpha Centauri, you can look at it in the next figures that's coming up, is we know um, 4.2 light years away, but it has a parallax of 0 0.747 arc second, and more distant stars have even smaller parallaxes. You see how small these angles are. Hold a piece of paper edgewise at arm's length. The thickness of the paper covers an angle of about 30 arc seconds. So this is another, uh, what do you mean does it mean you have to restart? No, you don't have to, so right now with your moon observations, you have to calculate the distances. So with your observations, you know now when if that's why you need your two scales, your scales are your surroundings around you, then the scale of how big the moon is, you can choose your scale, uh, any arbitrary numbers you want that's comfortable to you, then this is one method you can use to calculate, do your calculations on the moon. So we're going to look at this example. This is useful for your assignment as well, and I will also be able to ask something like this in the test and exam. So to find the distance to a star from its measured, it's a pleasure, measured parallax, astronomers use the same calculation you've already seen in the small angle formula. So heads up for your assignment, remember small angle formula. Imagine that you observe our solar system from the star, uh, 8.2 is still being catch, shows the angular separation you would measure between the Sun and Earth equals the star's parallax. Recall that a small angle formula relates an object's angular diameter, its linear diameter, and its distance. In this case, the angular di diameter is the parallax angle B, and the linear diameter, the base of the triangle, is 1 AU. And a small angle formula, rearranged slightly, tells you that distance d to the star in AU is equal to 2.06 times 10 to the power 5 divided by the parallax in arc seconds. So, going back, this equation right here, you have the distance in AU. So remember, remember a one AU is equal to this kilometers, and we just divide it by the parallax. So the constant 2.065 is a conversion factor. Number of arc seconds in a radian. So because the parallaxes of even the nearest stars are less than one arc second, the distances in AU are conveniently large numbers. To keep the numbers manageable, astronomers have to find the parsec as the primary unit of distance, in a way that simplifies the arithmetic. One parsec equals to 2.06 times 10 to the power 5 AU. 
So then we can write the equation as this. This parsec is the distance to any to an imaginary star whose parallax is one arc second. So now, example, the star Altair has a parallax of 0 0.195 arc second. How far away is it? So solution, distance in parsecs equals 1 divided by 0 0.195 or 5.13 parsecs. 1 parsec equals 3.26 light years away. So Altair is 16.7 light years away. So this is just basic plug and play. You all happy? Okay, cool. So here's exactly the question we had earlier. So, the blurring caused by Earth's atmosphere smears stars' images and makes them about one arc second diameter, even at a, at a good observatory site. And that makes it difficult to measure parallax from Earth, even when astronomers average together many observations. They cannot measure parallax from an observatory on Earth without uncertainty smaller than about 0 0.002 arc second. Therefore, if you measure parallax of 0 0.02 arc second from Earth, the uncertainty is about 10%. So, how do we solve this problem? We use observatories in space. So, the one we used is Hippocus. So, it was an operation from 89 to 93, it weighed 500 kilogram. It took measure about 100,000 measurements of stars and at an uh, accuracy of 2 milli arc seconds. And in Gaia that we are still using today, so this textbook was written in 2018, but we are still using Gaia. It weighs just a little bit more than two tons. It has calculated position of one billion stars and 150 million radial velocity. And it has an accuracy of 24 micro arc seconds. So this is impressive piece of equipment that we are using. Uh, is everyone still following? So, I want to ask you guys, how are we going to determine the brightness and luminosity of an object? So magnitude, yes, magnitude comes in, but how do we want now the exact luminosity and exact brightness? So yes, flux comes in, but how do we determine the flux? To solve this problem, we are going to learn about three new terms. So the first is apparent brightness, then intrinsic brightness, and then lastly, luminosity. So if you see a light on a dark highway, it is hard to tell how powerful it really is. It could be the brilliant headlight on a distant truck or the dim headlight on a nearby bicycle, so you guys understand the analogy. So, let's look at image P. To judge the true brightness of a light source, 
you need to know how far away it is. The headlight on a distant truck may appear as bright as light on the other bicycle, giving you no clue about the real distance. So this is what I talked about earlier on a definition of flux. So here we have a light source, we are close by, so we have a higher flux. If we go further away, the area becomes bigger and we have less flux. How bright an object appears depends not only on how much light it emits, but also on its distance from you. A six magnitude star, just visible to your eye, looks faint, but its apparent magnitude doesn't tell you how luminous it really is. Now that you know to find the distances to stars, you can use those distances to figure out the intrinsic brightness of the star. Intrinsic means belonging to the thing. So the intrinsic brightness of a star refers to the total amount of light the star emits. So you're still happy with the apparent magnitude that we discussed, the magnitude of a different star or objects. So now we know the, what the apparent magnitude is, so knowing the distances, we can figure out what the intrinsic brightness is. When you look at a bright light, your eyes respond to the visual wavelength photons falling on your eye's retina. The apparent brightness you perceive is related to the flux of energy entering your eye. Flux is defined as the energy in joules per second falling on one square meter. One joule per second is one watt, a common unit of energy consumption used, for example, to rate in light bulbs. So the apparent brightness of a light source is determined by the inverse square law. So you guys still following? So apparent magnitude is the magnitude scale we learned in the opening chapter of how bright objects are. So if things are magnitude 6, that's the faintest we can see with our naked eye. If we go in the negative, that's more bright. But that's the apparent brightness. How apparent is it? How it looks like from Earth. But now we want its intrinsic brightness, so its real brightness if we are actually next to it. So in astronomy, the inverse square law is very, very important. And especially in radio astronomy. So that means our density is inversely proportional to 1 divided by r squared, where r is the distance. So this is just a relative intensity. So if we are at an object, we will have the highest intensity. If we move two of the distance away, we will have a quarter of the intensity third and ninth, four times further, sixteenth, five times further, twenty-fifth. So that's why it's important. So for example, if you have a radio source next to a radio telescope, if you have exactly next to the telescope, you have the maximum intensity. But if you move four, say for example, four times the distance away, or two times the distance away, the Rate of intensity of the source will drop to 25th, 4th, 9th, 16th, 5 times further away, 25th, 6 times further away, 36. So you guys are happy with this definition of this inverse square law. Okay, so now 
when we visualize this, and that is what I was trying to draw earlier in this chapter. If we have our source and we have our one square meter area, and we have a distance all the way, the intensity will be larger because more field lines will go through the area. But if we are two times distance away, it is a fourth of the intensity. If we are three times the distance away, it is ninth of the intensity. So you guys happy with this? Okay. Yes, this um, forms part of Gauss's law, yes. Uh, so, <clears throat> yes, Mr. so if you're saying like light radiates in that way, like it radiates outwardly, right? Yes. Doesn't that mean we shouldn't get some um, like um, like so, like some parts of the object doesn't necessarily uh, it, be, it, be, it becomes invisible to us because that light doesn't come to us, correct? Yes, that's exactly one of the problems we have in astronomy. That's exactly it. So that's why we try to build these giant telescopes to see if we can pick up as much as information as possible and that we can make and detect these field lines hitting our telescopes. So that is why the square kilometer array is such an important project, because then we will have a telescope that has a surface area of one square kilometer. Um, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. So, so um, I, uh, I just want to go back to the chapters. So, so you say the way those telescopes capture that information, you don't have to capture the whole, um, the whole uh, electromagnetic wave. You just have to capture a quarter of it, right? And then from that, you can replicate yes. it. So that's yes. basically what you do when you capture a galaxy. You take one portion of it, and then you just infer the rest of the information. So there's one of two ways we can do it. So yes, we can infer the rest of the information. Or if we, for example, uh, what we do is if we look at a, this object that is far away, we call it a scanning observation. So for example, uh, let me draw on this image. If, for example, this is the galaxy with our spiral arms we have, and we have our telescope on Earth. So what we do is that's why it's important for us to be able to move and point these telescopes. So we call it a scanning observation. So then we will move this telescope left, right, up and down to be able to, so let me just get another color, to scan through this object. So what we will do is we will scan the object in a path up and down this way so we can construct the entire image and that can take a few days or even a few weeks or a few months to do. Or we can scan the object this way, and then we can construct an image, a full image of an object. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Awesome. So now question, what about gravitational lensing? So gravitational lensing is another important aspect we're going to discuss in later chapters. Um, but to quickly describe to you all, you're all familiar with gravitational lensing? Okay, so we're going to discuss this in later chapters. But let me quickly draw it. So basically what gravitational lensing is. 
So let's say there's a star. Here is Earth. And there's a object behind the star. So the star is it's called is blocking this object. So we know one thing that can bend space time and can influence electromagnetic waves and light waves is objects with a means gravitational pull. So objects with a means gravitational pull is giant stars and black holes. So what gravitational lensing is, it means we can actually see this object behind the star because the light is bent behind the star. So when we observe it, it will look actually, let me just draw it again, a little bit better. Here is the star. Here is the object. Here is Earth with our telescopes. So it would appear to us as we are looking at an object that is sitting right here or right here. But what actually is happening, the gravitational, the means gravity of the star is actually bending light waves that it seems like it's over here. So we can use gravitational lensing to look at objects that's hidden behind other stars or usually other stars or behind a black hole. So that's the short explanation of it, but we are going to discuss this quite thoroughly in later chapters. So maybe you've answered this already, but how do you measure the light from one source and how do you get rid of the light from other sources? So do you mean from sources in space or sources from close around you? So sources from space, unfortunately, you don't want to block out anything coming from space because then you will might lose information from the object you're looking at. So we will speak from electromagnetic radiation from other objects or light from other objects as background information or background noise. So you don't really get rid of it. And you point your telescope to specific objects, so the intensest readings you'll get from that object is from the direct point of view from the telescope, and the rest is background noise, if that makes sense. Okay. So you can see that if you know both the apparent magnitude of a star, so expressing the flux received on Earth from it and its distance, you can use the inverse square law to correct for distance and learn the intrinsic brightness of the star. Astronomers do that using a special kind of magnitude scale described in the next section. So we call this the absolute visual magnitude. If all stars were the same distance from Earth, you could compare one with another and easily determine which was emitting more light and which less. Of course, the stars are scattered at different, at different distances, and you can't shove them around to line them up for comparison. If, however, you know the distance to a star, you can use the inverse square relation to calculate the brightness that star would have at the same standard distance. Astronomers have adopted 10 parsecs as the standard distance and referred to the absolute visual magnitude of a star as the apparent visual magnitude it would have if it were 10 parsecs away. Are you guys following?
Okay. Define a star's absolute visual magnitude. You begin by measuring its apparent visual magnitude. So in other words, its brightness. A relatively easy task. Then you need the distance to the star. If the star is nearby, you can measure its parallax and from that calculate distance. Once you know the distance, you can use a simple formula to correct the apparent visual magnitude for the distance and find the absolute visual magnitude. So here is another example. So we, you might find something like this in the test and exam. So absolute magnitude and distances. So apparent visual magnitude tells you how bright a star looks. So apparent visual magnitude we've done in the opening chapters. So we did it in chapter 2, so now I'm reasoning with numbers 2.1. But absolute visual magnitude tells you how luminous the star really is. The absolute visual magnitude, so MV of a star, is the apparent visual magnitude the star would have if it were 10 parsecs away. If you know a star's apparent visual magnitude and its distance, you can calculate, calculate its absolute visual magnitude. So the magnitude distance formula that allows this calculation relates apparent visual magnitude, so MV, distance in parsec, D, and the absolute visual magnitude, MV. So please take note and don't confuse apparent visual magnitude and absolute visual magnitude. So this is the equation. So if you remember the equation from chapter two, this is the equation that we are going to use. So apparent measure visual magnitude minus absolute visual magnitude equals minus five plus 5 log d, where d is the distance in par 6. So the expression log means logarithm to base 10. Sometimes it is convenient to rearrange the equation and write it in the following form. So rewriting the equation and getting rid of the log we have the distance in par 6 equals 10 times the apparent visual magnitude minus the absolute visual magnitude plus 5 to the power 5. It is the same equation, so you can use whichever form is most convenient in a given problem. If you know the distance, the first form of the equation is convenient. But if you're trying to find a distance, the second form of the equation is best. So, example, the famous star Polaris is 133 parsecs from Earth and has an apparent magnitude, apparent visual magnitude of plus 2. So what is the absolute visual magnitude? So solution, so we can use a pocket calculator. So the pocket calculator tells you that log 133 equals 2.12, so we're using this equation here. So we plug in the numbers and we solve for the absolute magnitude. So solving for the absolute magnitude tells you that the absolute visual magnitude of Polaris is minus 3.6. If it were only 10 parsecs from Earth, it would dominate the night sky. So you guys happy with this reasoning with numbers, this straightforward plug and play? Okay, so how does the sun stack up against other stars? The sun is tremendously bright in the sky, but it's also very nearby. Its absolute visual magnitude is just 14.8. So if the sun were only 10 parsecs from Earth, so about 33 light years, so it's not a great distance, in speaking in astronomy terms, it would look no brighter than the faintest star in the handle of the Little Dipper. So 
So, absolute. So this is our apparent visual magnitude of the star, our own sun. But if we look at the absolute visual magnitude of our own sun, it would just look like one of these stars in the Big Dipper. Everyone still following? Okay. So the intrinsically brightest stars known have absolute visual magnitudes of about 28.3, which means that such a star 10 parsec from Earth would be more than 20 times as bright as Venus at its brightest. Such stars have intrinsic brightnesses of 30 magnitudes brighter than the Sun, which means they are emitting over 100,000 times more light than the Sun. In contrast, the intrinsically faintest stars have absolute visual magnitudes of plus 16 or fainter. They are 11 magnitudes fainter than the Sun, meaning they are emitting 25,000 times less light and visible wavelengths than the Sun. Now we're going to look at luminosity. The luminosity of a star is the total energy that a star radiates in one second. Hot stars emit a great deal of ultraviolet light that you can't see, and cool stars emit mostly infrared light. Absolute visual magnitude includes only visible radiation. So astronomers must make a correction, sometimes quite large, to account for invisible energy. Then they can calculate the total luminosity of the star from its absolute magnitude. So astronomers often express luminosities in solar units, meaning that they write 2.5 times L with this symbol that looks like a solar system. To present the star has 2.5 times the luminosity of the sun. So remember, we have a symbol, something that looks like our solar system. That is the symbol of solar, so 2.5 times the luminosity of the sun. To find the luminosity of a star in joules per second, you can just multiply the luminosity of the sun in those units. So 3.8 times 10 to the power 26 joules per second. Famous star Aldebaran has a luminosity of about 425 solar luminosity units, or solar units, which corresponds to about 6.5 times 10 to the power 28 joules per second. The most luminous stars emit at least a billion times more energy per second than the least luminous. Clearly, the family of stars contains some interesting characters. So, Sir, can two stars have the same apparent visual magnitude, but different luminosity or absolute visual magnitude? Yes, that's absolutely true. So, when the apparent, because if you look at the apparent visual magnitude, that's how the luminosity or brightness will look apparent to Earth. But if you use the absolute, this how it will look if you place those two stars at a distance of 10 parsecs, then you can see there's a difference in the luminosity. I and mean, then, Mr. Tony, uh, what would you like me to repeat? Okay, so let me go back to slide 27. So, this slide, Mr. Tony. So what I meant with this slide is, if we use the absolute visual magnitude of our sun, and we put our sun at a distance of 10 parsecs away from Earth, it will look like one of the same brightness as one of the stars in the constellation, the Big Dipper. So that means our star, it's close to us, so we perceive it as really bright. But standardizing it and looking at its absolute visual magnitude, it's not really a bright star. 
Does that clear up a few things? Pleasure. So you guys are happy with luminosity? Okay. So now we're going to start looking at stellar spectra. So observations of spectral lines gives you information about what types of atoms are in the atmospheres of the sun, planets, and stars. So this is a emission spectrum. So here we can see the wavelength we are looking at. Here we can see the flux. So, so, so here we can see we have beta hydrogen, we have helium, we have O3, another helium, alpha hydrogen, and that's how we determine what's going on. So, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, when astronomers were making the first careful studies of stellar spectra, the big differences observed between spectra of different stars were thought to show that stars have a wide range of compositions. In the 1920s, Cecilia Payne made use of information from atomic physics and the new field of quantum mechanics to reinterpret the spectra of stars. Payne's calculations show that over 90% of the atoms in the Sun and other stars must be hydrogen, and most of the rest are helium. Payne discovered that 1. The chemical composition of the Sun is like the composition of other stars, and 2. Spectra actually provide information mostly about the temperatures of stars. And three, stars with similar spectra must have similar temperatures. So how do you guys think we get temperature from spectra? Any idea, guys? Using frequency, measure the infrared. So we are looking at the more blue than hotter. So yes, that's one thing we're looking at. That's correct, Mr. Lavuyo. But let's look at it. So this will clear up a few things. So the first is the Bolmer thermometer. So one of the main methods Spain first developed for using spectra to determine star temperatures is now called the Bolmer thermometer. Recall that astronomers used the Kelvin temperature scale when referring to stellar temperatures. These temperatures range from 2,300 Kelvin to about 15,000 Kelvin. Compare these extremes with the surface temperature of the Sun, which is about 5,800 Kelvin. So from the information about black body radiation and Bean's law, you already know how to estimate the star's temperature by using its color. But the spectral lines of hydrogen at wavelengths visible to the human eye, called the Bolmer lines, combined with a few other spectral lines, give you much greater precision in estimating stellar temperatures. The Bolmer thermometer works because the strength of the Bolmer lines depends on the temperature of the star's surface layers. Both hot and cool stars have weak Bolmer lines, but medium temperature stars have strong Bolmer lines. That is because the Bolmer absorption lines are produced only by atoms with electrons in a second energy level. So the Bolmer thermometer, so hydrogen Bolmer lines are strongest for medium temperature stars with photospheres of about 10,000 Kelvin. Lines of ionized calcium are strongest at lower temperatures than the hydrogen Bolmer lines. 
and the spectral lines of each atom, ion or molecule, are strongest at a particular temperature. During the 1890s, astronomers at Harvard Observatory invented the first widely used system for classifying stellar spectra. One of those scientists, Annie J. Cannon, personally inspected a spectra of over 250,000 stars. Spectra were first classified into groups labeled A through Q. But some of those groups were later dropped, merging with others, or recorded the final classification scheme includes seven major temperature spectral classes or types still used today so o b a f g k and m during the sequence of spectral types called the spectral sequence is a temperature sequence the o stars are the hardest and the temperature decreases along the sequence to m stars the coolest for better definition, astronomers divide each spectral class into 10 subclasses. For example, spectral class A consists of the subclasses A0, A1, A2, all the way up to A9. Next comes F0 to F9, and so on. The finer division gives a star's temperature to a precision of about 5%. The Sun, for example, is not just a G star, but a G2 star. So here we can see the different classes. So class O star has approximate temperature of 40,000 Kelvin. The hydrogen bulb lines is weak and other spectral features is ionized helium. And here is an example of a star where we can see this. Then, for example, a class F type is 6,600 Kelvin. Class M is 3,000 Kelvin. The hydrogen bulb lines is weak. Everyone's still following. Uh, no, you don't have to know these values by heart. Uh, the only thing you need to know is that what are the classifications, so these letters, and which one is the hottest and which one is the coldest. So yeah, color photographs of stellar spectra ranging from O stars at the top to cool M stars at the bottom. The hydrogen bulma lines are strongest at spectral type A0, but the two closely spaced lines of sodium and the yellow are strongest for very cool stars. Helium lines appear only in a spectra of the outer stars. Notice that the helium line visible in the top spectrum has nearly but not exactly the same wavelength as sodium lines visible in cooler stars. Bands produced by molecule titanium oxide are strong in spectra of the coolest stars. So here we can see the spectrum of these different classifications. So this is how it will look like through our telescopes. So spectra are often represented as graph of intensity versus wavelength, with dark absorption lines appearing as sharp dips in the curves. This set of spectra displays hot stars at the top and cool stars at the bottom. Hydrogen bulma lines are strongest at spectral type A0, whereas lines of ionized calcium are strongest in K stars. Titanium oxide bands are strongest in M stars. So compare the spectra with the information in the previous figures that we have just so these previous images we look at. So this is why spectrometry, spectrometry is an important aspect of astronomy. Now you can learn something new about some of the famous stars. So Sirius, the brightest star in the southern hemisphere, and it's brilliant in the winter sky. We can actually see it now if you go outside of the lesson, you see a bright star more or less on a 12 o'clock position. That is Sirius, and it's a one star. And Vega, 
bright overhead in a summer sky is a, a zero star. They have nearly the same temperature and color, and both have strong Volmer lines in their spectra. The bright red star in Orion is Betelgeuse, so Betelgeuse is a super red giant, and it's a cool M2 star. But blue white Rigel, so that's the second brightest star, star, star in the southern hemisphere, you'll see it next to Sirius, is a hot B8 star. Polaris, the north star, is an F8 star, a bit hotter than our own sun. And Alpha Centauri, the closest star to us, you just see it when you look at the pointers of the Southern Cross, the closest star to the Sun, is a G2 star just like our own Sun. Now, the study of spectral types is more than a century old, but astronomers continue to discover and define new types. The L dwarfs found in 1998 are cooler and fainter than M stars. They are understood to be objects smaller than stars but larger than planets and are called round dwarfs, which you will learn more about in a later chapter. The spectra of M stars contain bands produced by metal oxide, such as titanium oxide, but L dwarf spectra contains bands produced by molecules such as iron hydride. The T dwarfs are even cooler and fainter type of brown dwarf than L dwarfs. The spectra shows absorption by methane and water vapor. In 2011, astronomers using infrared space telescopes, large ground-based telescopes, and highly sensitive infrared detectors discovered a class of object with temperature below 500 Kelvin that are labeled Y dwarfs. So you can see these six infrared spectra show the differences between L dwarfs and T dwarfs. Spectra of M stars show titanium oxide, but L and T dwarfs are so cool that other molecules such as iron hydride, water and methane dominate these spectra. So here we can see absorption by iron hydride is strong in L dwarfs. Water vapor absorption bands are very strong in cooler stars. And absorption by methane is strong in T dwarfs. Now that you know the luminosities of stars, you're ready to find their sizes, usually expressed as radii or diameters. Recall that astronomers can't see stars as disks through astronomical, astronomical telescopes. Diameter of a few stars have been measured and surface features on a very small number of stars, including famous star Betelgeuse, have been distinguished using the technique of interferometry. But essentially, all stars look like points of light, no matter how big the telescope. Nevertheless, there are straightforward way to find the sizes of stars. If you know a star's temperature and luminosity, you can determine its radius. That relationship will introduce you to the most important diagram in astronomy, which sorts stars by temperature, luminosity, and size. And in later chapters, we'll help you learn about this life cycle of stars. So here again, we have a bit better picture of star sizes. So over here, we have Sun. So you remember we call the, its official name is Sol. It's the size as one pixel. So here we can see Sirius, Octaurus. Here we can see Betelgeuse, Antares, the Pistol Star, KW Sagittarius. We have B345 Chirpay, DB Chirpay. So you guys still following? So how do you guys think we will use luminosity and brightness and temperature to find the size? How do they relate to one another?
Any idea, guys? How do we use luminosity and temperature to find its size? Exactly that, Mr. Libuyo. Bigger radius, more surface area to radiate energy from. Yes. So to use the luminosity and temperature of a star to find its size, you first need to understand the two factors that affect the star's luminosity. So firstly, the surface area, and secondly, the temperature. Just a hint for testing exams. What are these two factors? So you can eat dinner by candlelight because the candle flame has a small surface area. Although the flame is very hot, it cannot radiate much heat. It has low luminosity. Although if the candle flame were 12 feet tall, it would have had a very large surface area from which to radiate. And although it might not be no hotter than normal candle flame, its luminosity would drive you from the table. So you guys following this analogy? Molten lava pouring from a volcano is not as hot as a candle flame, but lava flow has more surface area and radiates more energy than a candle flame. Approaching a lava, approaching a lava without protective gear is dangerous. So you understand the difference between a candle and lava. Bigger surface area, smaller surface area. So, did you just say that lava is, is has a sm uh, lower temperature than a candle flame? Uh, yeah, so molten lava uh, pouring from volcano is not as hot as a candle flame. So it's not, it's not as hot, but it radiates more energy. It all depends on surface area. So you guys still following or did I just blow your minds? Okay, mind blown. So remember so in a candle, it's hotter, but you have less energy because the surface area is smaller. But in lava, you have, it's less hot than a candle flame, but you have more energy because the surface area is bigger. In a similar way, a hot star may not be very luminous if it has a small surface area, but it could be highly luminous if it were larger and had a larger surface area from which to radiate. On the other hand, even a cool star could be luminous if it had a large surface area. Because of this dependence on both temperature and surface area, you need to separate their effects to find the sizes of stars. The Hertzsprung Russell, or in short, HR diagram, named after its originators, Netherlands astronomer Enger Hertzsprung and US astronomer Henry Norris Russell, is a graph that separates the effects of temperature and surface area on stellar luminosities and enables astronomers to sort and classify stars to their sizes. So this is very important. If you want to go continue on with an astronomy career, astrophysics career, a career somewhere to do with space or space sciences, you're going to eat, breathe, live, sleep the HR diagram. So with the HR diagram, before we get to it, this is just another analogy to explain how it works. You could analyze automobiles, so cars, by plotting their horsepower versus their weight. 
and this revealed relationships between various models. Most would lie somewhere along the main sequence of normal cars. So here you will have cars that has a lot of horsepower and its weight is heavy. Here we will have lower horsepower and will be light. And here we'll have classified racing cars, sports cars, economy models, and then the normal cars. The same way we can classify our star. So in an HR diagram, the location of a point tells you a great deal about the star it represents. Points near the top of the diagram represents very luminous stars, and points near the bottom represent very low luminosity stars. Points near the right edge of the diagram represents very cool stars, and points near the left edge of the diagram represents very hot stars. So here we have our HR diagram. So stars represented by dots as a position that shows the stars luminosity and temperature. The background color in this diagram indicates the temperature of the stars. The sun is a yellow white G2 star. Most stars, including the sun, have properties along the main sequence strip running from hot high luminosity stars at upper left to cool low luminosity stars at the right. So if we have stars over here, they are extremely luminous and have extremely high temperature. Stars over here has a very low luminosity and very low temperatures. So stars on this main sequence is we call them main sequence stars. So once they are born, they will form somewhere here on the main sequence. And as they go through their life cycle, they will move through the main sequence. But here we have more luminous stars are plotted toward the top of the HR diagram. Cooler stars are red and lie to the right. Fainter stars are plotted as points near the bottom. Other stars are blue and lie to the left. So you guys, do you guys understand our HR diagram and how we can categorize it as O stars will be here, B stars here, A, F, G, K, and M. Okay. The main sequence is the region of the HR diagram running from upper left to lower right. It includes roughly 80% of all stars. As you might expect, the hot main sequence stars are more luminous than the cool main sequence stars. Notice in HR diagram that some cool stars lie above the main sequence. Although they are cool, they are luminous. And that must mean they are larger and have more surface area than main sequence stars at the same temperature. These are called giant stars, and they are roughly 10 to 100 times larger than the sun. There are super giant stars at the top of the HR diagram that are over a thousand times the sun's diameter. So questions. So an HR diagram simultaneously displays size, luminosity, and temperature and spectral type only and nothing else. Yes, that's true. So with the HR diagram, we know what its luminosity, temperature, and size. So let's go back one slide. So stars that are over here are at high temperature and is very luminous. Stars in the right corner are as a low temperature and less luminous. Stars over here are very luminous but much cooler. So stars over here are so here are classified as giants and supergiants. Is everyone still following? So our own sun is just a normal star and a main sequence over here. So stars, we have just said the giant stars and supergiant stars. But now at the bottom of the HR diagram lie the economy models, stars that are very low in luminosity because they are very small. At the bottom end of the main sequence, the red dwarfs are not only small, they are also cool. 
that gives them low luminosities. In contrast, the white dwarfs lie in the lower left of the HR diagram and are lower in luminosity than you would expect given their high temperatures. That must mean they are very small, although some white dwarfs are among the hottest stars known. They are so small they have very little surface area from which to radiate, and that limits them to low luminosities. So now we're going to put this together, luminosity, radius, and temperature. Keep in mind this for tests and exams. The luminosity L of a star depends on two things, its size and its temperature. If the star has a large surface area from which to radiate, it can have a high luminosity. Recall from the this decision, discussion of blackbody radiation and reasoning with number 6.1. That amount of energy emitted per second from each square meter of the star's surface, we can write that as omega t to the power 4. This the star's luminosity can be written as the surface area in square meters times the amount of it radiates from each square meter. So luminosity equals surface times qt uh, omega t to the power 4. Because a star is a sphere, you can use the formula. So the surface area pi r squared, and we get this equation for our luminosity. This may seem complicated, but if you express luminosity, radius, and temperature in proportion to the sun, you get a simpler form. So here we have luminosity divided by solar luminosity. So here we have the radius over solar radius, temperature over solar temperature. So suppose a star has 10 times the sun's radius, but only half the temperature. How luminous is it? So we plug it into the formula. 10 times its radius, so 1 will be our own sun's radius, um, half the luminosity. So it would be 6.2 times the sun's luminosity. You guys happy with that? Okay, so example B. Suppose you measure the apparent brightness and parallax of a star and thereby determine its intrinsic brightness. The star's spectrum shows that its surface is two times hotter than the sun. That allows you to correct the intrinsic brightness to include non-visible radiation. So you can calculate that its total luminosity is 40 solar luminosities. What is the radius of the star relative to the sun's radius? So knowing the star's luminosity and temperature, you can find its radius. So you just take the normal equation that we've got here. We plug in the equations. We solve for this ratio. So we have the ratio is 1.6. So the star is 60% larger than the radius of the sun. So you guys happy with this explanation? So what the math we're going to do in this course is straightforward plug and play as the examples we've done so far. So ladies and gentlemen, I see we have two minutes of this lecture left. I think we're going to call this a night. We're going to continue on our discussion next week on star sizes, so giants, supergiants, and dwarf stars. So thank you for an awesome lecture. I know this is a lot of information to take in, so I'll remain active if you guys have a few more questions. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to log off. Have a great evening and good luck with the rest of your week. Okay, so, so you're not sure, I understand how we substitute values into the formula. So, is it this formula we are looking at? Okay, so what part are you struggling with? 
this substitute. So, in this equation, this L is the luminosity of the star we are observing, and this L with this weird symbol that looks like a solar system is solar luminosity, meaning the luminosity of our own sun. The normal R is the radius of the star we are observing. The R is our solar radii, meaning the radius of our own sun. T, the temperature of the object we are observing, and T, the temperature of our own sun. So we know what the values is of our sun, so the rest is just plug and play, but in this examples, suppose a star has 10 times the sun's radius, but only half its temperature. So here we have the ratio. So we can call our own sun as 1, and the other sun is radius is 10 times larger, so we plug in 10. But now we know, so now we have the temperature, so we know that it is half the temperature. So now the ratio of half the temperature is a half. Power 4 and just plug and play, so that means the luminosity of the other star is 6.25 times the sun's luminosity. Yes, yeah, so exactly, those are just ratios. So these examples, we use ratios, but you can use the same formula to calculate for true values as well. So you can take this formula and we can plug in our own sun's actual radius, our own sun's actual luminosity and its temperature. It's a pleasure. So if no further question, guys, I will also log off. Have a great evening and good luck with the rest of you of your week. Goodbye, guys.